like to go right now to that upwelling center off the west coast of, uh, of South America and up to the uh, Russian coast of the Bering Sea. God, those are wild. <laughs> wild like that. Need to see. So he's, he fortunately knows an awful lot about coastal ecosystems there from the watersheds down and off into the shelves. So our hope is this year we'll learn a lot about those summer while he's learning all he can about our this is as much a life history I'll, uh, I'll give you as Canada. Francisco, uh, he went from Brazil to Argentina and back. And the last South American who, not Argentina, Australia. Uh, the last Australian who made, uh, uh, he was a Brazilian, who made the same bounce, uh, took up the flute many years ago before one of these seminars, came back and they hit a mud flat. And he went out the front and was up to here. He came in washed with water, stinking of hydrogen sulfide. It was wonderful for mud people. Today, that mud flat doesn't exist. It dried right over. <laughs> That's the difference. The rest is for you. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks, Joan. Thanks, everybody, for coming from the seminar. So I give this title some months ago, which is a pretty general, but I'm going to talk mostly about uh, estuaries and benthic assemblages with a few and other subjects in between. Uh, so, as John said, uh, I'm, I did my degree in oceanography as an undergrad, and then I did a master's in ecology in the University of Sao Paulo, and then a PhD in consortium in Australia, as John said. And I'm here since January last year, or oh, this year, January, will be till end of January next year, so I'll be around. So there is three important points that I wanted to do before I start with the talk. First is the. Francisco, can you hear in the back okay? No. Wow. No. So, three important points that I want to do before I go in through the, the, the talk. So, the first is estuaries. Nowadays, we can have some pretty wide definition of estuaries. As instance, for instance, this one from Potter 2010, where basically it's anything that's permanently or periodically open to the sea. They must have at least a periodical discharge from a river, and it can become from less than salt water salinity to uh, hypersaline waters. That's one point. Another important point is those things, they are variable. They're very, pretty much variable systems. That's why, why these people in 2007 said, call the storing quality paradox. So there, is, there are naturally environmental stressed areas. So they have a high degree of variability in oxygen, temperature, and salinity, for instance. So natural stress is, can be similar to anthropogenic stress, making very harder but then, uh, to detect impacts than in nearby ecosystems like marine or freshwater. And the third important point, if you look in the literature, personal observation, you can see all kinds of work that people are supposed to work in along storing systems. People look at different uh, biological assemblages as mangroves, uh, salt marshes, benthic uh, invertebrates, fish, phytoplankton, doesn't matter. You go, you're going to see a lot of variability in the types of designs from clustered sampling, samples, stations, like more like uh, here and here, uh, like uh, uh, just a little piece of the system sampled and so on. So basically, there is those three observations here. There are different types of estuaries. There is lots of variability between systems. There is a large variability in each of those systems. And there are also what I'm calling technical variability. There is lots of different approach how people go in out there and sample those systems. So the question is, are there general patterns along estuaries? So I'm going to talk uh, mostly about some empirical research that was made in the tropics back home. I'm going to very quickly talk about filling the gap between theory and practice and some insights about epistemological research and the research that I have been doing here in the Benthic Ecology Lab in Moss Landing. So this is uh, called uh, Bahia de Todos os Santos. This is Brazil, this is uh, the state of Bahia. The Salvador city here, it's around 13 degrees latitude. It's pretty tropical. Salvador city is a very large city with more than 
two and a half million people, but most live in this area here. So this bay is the second largest bay in Brazil. It's more than, more than uh, 1,000 square kilometers. There is three main tributaries, Subaé River, Paraguaçu River, and Jaguaripe River. Those, there are very quite different systems. The, this is a more pristine system. This is not so much in, impacted by anthropogenic impacts in general. And this, the upper part of it, is a lot of uh, inorganic contaminants. And they differ in the amount of fresh water they put into the systems as well, in the, into the main system as well. So the circulation of this bay is mainly driven by tide. It's a well mixed water column, so they really, the estuarine part of it, are, those are in the main channels here of those systems. Those are the estuarine conditions from zero to close to 35 salinities. Obviously, we are uh, under the pressure of different scale impacts, like large scale climate changes. There is also an increase in population and industries around the, the bay. There is no developing of planning of development whatsoever, poor, generally poor effluent treatment, and uh, lots of habitat destruction. So there are several environmental problems and at different stages in different parts of this bay and, on, and also from the rivers. So we're gonna look at the general patterns in first in the subtidal benthic macrofauna, this, and then look at the intertidal benthic macrofauna and a little bit about mangrove forest. So that's the empirical research. So subtidal, those are the sampling stations or each of those systems. What was done here or how, how first how they were positioned, they were, they were made, make, made sure that we positioned those stations from zero to close to 35 salinities. So we made sure that those, those stations were covering completely the story gradient. In each of those dots we, we sample uh, two sites with several replicates using cores and or grabs, maybe between six and, and eight replicates. And we also collect uh, sediments for grain size and contaminant analysis. And we sample on those systems at different times. So I'm gonna show lots of grabs and so they're gonna appear really small. So I'm going show, showing this first one very large so we can make sense for whatever the other ones are. So there will be always number of individuals here. This is one system. So this is the station going landward from marine to fresh water. So this is basically the, the abundance of different taxa. This is the family of terrestrialites. And those are different sampling dates. So this can be seven months apart or even less or more. So they are more than representative for seasons. They are different sampling times. And each dot is the sum of all the replicates on that station, on that time, on that system. So what you see here is, in this is one system only and different taxa. I'm gonna show only the most abundant and frequent taxa, right? So what I can easily see here, that's the direct gradient analysis stuff that uh, Whitebaker did uh, when he was climbing up and down mountains, just uh, looking at the peak of the abundance of the different taxa. So that's what I'm doing here. You can see a cl clear, or clearly see that uh, there is a replacement of species. As you go along from uh, marine to more fresh water conditions, you see there are different uh, species, different taxa appearing along the gradient. So pretty much there is a high degree of specificity along this gradient. So each taxa is a specialist adapted to local conditions. So, in fact, if we do those for another system here and another one here, this is one that I just showed, you always see this pattern. So who cares? Well, it looks like for some taxa, silver tulids, for instance, independent of the place of the, all the difference of the systems within and be, or the, between the systems and timing difference, they appear, uh, for instance, in places with a more marine influence independent of the, the system and independent of the date. And we can see this also, for instance, for some uh, uh, nereidids, other polychids, they are much more in the upper estuary. 
and uh, telinids, which you can see here, goes along with the, the gradient, and then sort of there can, can appear some peaks here uh, in the upper estuary. And some taxa only in a few, and lots of noise, obviously. Some taxa that just appear one peak and doesn't appear anymore, or just uh, regard, it just appear in one, one uh, uh, system. But there is some consistent uh, peaks of abundance along the gradients and the dif dif different estuaries. Another thing that we need to think about it is about the stewarding diversity model. So I bring the remaining, there was a model that was made in all for the Baltic Sea in 1934. So these guys said, look, there is, in terms of number of species, and there is salinity here, as you go from uh, fresh water to something around five and eight salinity, there is a decrease in the richness, and then start to increase again. So this is what you call freshwater animals, brackish animals, and all the white part here is marine animals. This was revealed by Whitfield last year. And they published this paper here, in which is, there is not much of a difference. The review was really nice. They comment and discuss a lot of those patterns in the literature, but the, the, end, the product, the, the end of the, the model that they, they, they suggest in the end is just something that goes, it, it's a similar pattern, but it just goes from 35 plus salinity. So that's what's in the, that's one of the oldest paradigms in storing ecology. If you look out of the results uh, from Brazil, you see those are the different systems. This is the total number of taxa. Instead of changing turn my graphs, I turn their graphs for comparisons, <laughs> which I thought that they wouldn't be in the room. So this is from salt water to fresh water. And I sort of forgot about the, what is hypersaline stuff. And what we see here, well, there is some decrease, you know, some variation, but it looks like, well, here some variation, but it, it looks like there is a decrease and there is no increase for freshwater systems. So I have been observing this in other papers in the literature. So uh, at this stage, you guys, well, that's the uh, biological. What is, what about sediment? What about environmental stuff? Is there variability in grain size? Well, quite shocking that not really much, it's just an example here in one system. You see like in March 2006, six months later and three years later, it looks like the same stuff. So some stations had, well, upper stations were mainly dominated by sand, middle parts of this system mainly dominated by silt and clay, mud stuff, and then some peaks on this somewhere uh, uh, of uh, granule, which is mainly uh, shell, biodetritic uh, sediment. And then you might be thinking, well, what about the contamination of the sediment sample? Is there temporal variability? Ooh, that's a, a horrible graph because there's lots of information. We should focus on those ones. Whatever that has the same color here is the same system in different uh, times. So this is one system, Subwaya, one, two, three, four times. And then there is Paraguasu in, in blue and in green, Jaguaripe. This second scale here is not the milligrams by kilograms, but it's also milligrams by kilograms, but that second scale here in those two refers to the green and blue. That's because the red system, that we used to buy, is highly contaminated. They, couldn't, they wouldn't fit in the same scale. So there is variability within lines of the same color, but that's not much. Eleven is fresh. fresh. It's always going landward. So there is some variability between systems, not much between times within systems. So you can see here the systems, Jaguarip is the most pristine one, less infected one. So there is more uh, uh, carbon, uh, nitrogen, and S over there. And here, those stations from Subaya, most contaminated one with zinc, uh, lead, nickel, and so forth. So from this work, what you can think is, there is time is not more important than space. There are differences between estuaries, but even though it seems that there are general patterns of benthic fauna variation along estuaries, and also sediment. So for instance, decrease in richness and peaks of abundance in similar uh, regions of each system. 
So that's another horrible graph. So this is the PRDA partialing out season and estuary. So there is everything there, you know, the stations, the taxa. Well, I would just plot also uh, salinity. So pretty much what I did, I just did it by hand. I just colored the station where it's more marine to the fresh ones. So the idea here was to show that uh, in spite of the time and in spite of the difference between systems, there is some pretty nice similarities among systems. So there is some general understanding of those patterns independent of the history and time. Intertidal, so the question remains the same. So we went there and we sample the same systems where we just throw to the margin. We draw with a coin and we go left or right. So that's what we did. And we sample pretty much in those points, also benthic stuff, benthic invertebrates with several replicates, six replicates, and sediments for organic matter, grain size, and carbon content. And not surprisingly, what we saw is this is an one system, another system, another system. It's something really similar, not the same taxa, but for instance, capitalids, where most, uh, the, the peaks of abundance of capitalids would be uh, in a up in the history, mid up of the history, independent in of the system. Spionids also up there in the three systems, and also narrated mostly in the up uh, stations of the river. Uh, if we look at the intertidal uh, richness, those are the three systems, again, and comparing with the subtidal, it's ridiculously similar. Would you expect it to change? I would expect to change. There is desiccation there. You know, there is much more organic matter than in, in, in subtidal stations. But the patterns are really, really similar of richness. And also, if you look at uh, this as analysis, just uh, uh, to check if uh, which best combination of environmental variables would explain the structure of the benthic assemblages. If you see the best combinations, this is as higher as it goes is the best correlation. Actually, it's a correlation. And uh, you see that salinity, it's always there. Sometimes only salinity explain is the better explain the whole biological data. So salinity is in fact very important. What about mangroves? What happened with the mangroves? So for this, I found a very keen student, pretty hard environment to work. She's very skinny, so she doesn't go deep on the mud. She's very energetic. So we did this in the same similar ten stations. In each station, she was there and we, we marked uh, three 10 by 10 square uh, meters and she measured whatever was taller than uh, 1.3 uh, meters and she measured, identified the species and measured the height and measured the diameter. So in, we end up uh, uh, having uh, for the vegetation data, uh, skin density, main basal area, mean height and the density of each species. And you also collect forward salinity, uh, silt and clay, and organic matter. So there is obviously a quite strong correlation from uh, the uh, for water interstitial salinity with the water salinity from the main channel and with the distance from the mouth. So whatever you use it would be a good uh, representation of the gradient. So for this graph, I choose to put distance from the by editor of Santos. So also we are going landward from marine high salinity to low salinity. So we have, the nitty thing about these systems is uh, they have only four species. We have a mo mostly three, four uh, species of, of uh, mangrove for, uh, tree in the forest. So the first one is from mangli, which is a classical one that's everywhere around the globe. So we see there is uh, more of those these are made in, these are measured in the percent of basal area, which is a very funny way that botanic people use to, to, to represent abundance, really, right? So you can see those rhizophora, they appear mostly in the high salinity areas. The second, the Laguncularia Hasemosa, would uh, fluctuate a bit, but the peaks of abundance are sort of middle, up history. Avicenna Shauriana, 
uh, sort of going ups and downs along the system of the three systems. And then Avicenna germinum, which occur in Jaguaripe and in Subae, uh, mostly in the upper stations. We also spotted in this system, but by chance we didn't sample it. So general patterns here, species composition along, along each history, you, you could easily see by multiple regression that salinity matters and there is some uh, um, difference in the composition which is consistent uh, between systems as the graphs show it. Uh, however, we have another hypothesis about changes in mangrove structure in general, in, uh, uh, is, uh, is which uh, would be variation in the height or density along the system, we couldn't find any. A little bit about filling the gap has something to do with uh, who cares. Like, I mean, it's well reported in the literature that academia research uh, uh, is generally really far from the policy making. So that, that can be quite frustrating. So we are, maybe we are just uh, uh, describing degradation. So there is a good example of editorial nature, the great divide. Uh, so there's lots of papers on that, how you can fill in the gap. So we, the group did some approximation with these people here. This is a marine reserve. This is one of the systems. So we are, we are working partnership and we're developing a database of everything that was made on this system. Whatever uh, quality was it, like uh, all the gray literature with free hard work. So we did a public uh, database on work, all, all kinds of work that have been done. We put in the, uh, we put in a map. And uh, that, with our work added to that, we suggested uh, stations for monitoring for those people. And we also work with fisheries data analysis that they have lots of data on fish, fisheries. So that's uh, in trying to get something out there that something is useful because if you just keep in trying to get in grants and publish your stuff, uh, maybe if we're lucky, 100 people read it and policy, we're never gonna be made it anywhere. So we need to leave our comfortable office away sometimes and try to deal with these people, which is not really easy. Epistemological research, that, uh, that little branch of the research that uh, the group is doing, that's something to do with the, the f when you feel uncomfortable, if you read the literature and you see different concepts being used in, in any way as people, each author used the same concept to say something different. So what it did here, we selected using story gradient doing a web search. We selected 3,000 papers. So within those 3,000, we looked whatever was biological assemblage and our community, then we end up with 300 papers. And then we random selected 30 papers and we, I sort of, I could, I like, I asked, uh, uh, I asked a lot for my group, so I finally end up with nine, nine readers to, to be able to read those 30 papers and fill a table, a big table that uh, evaluated, for instance, the conceptual problems identified by the authors of those papers, if there were ambiguity, if there are controversy on it, the conceptual problem uh, identified by the readers, and whatever conceptual, <coughs> conceptual misusage that uh, you could identify reading those. And obviously, those, those still uh, are researching on course. There is uh, things like ecological status, ecosystem health, that uh, it's a mess, it's a conceptual mess. So the, 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 the idea here is to finish this work and try to clean a bit the conceptual usage on the, this field. And also, uh, looking a bit ahead, we are very interested in modeling stuff, but we, didn't, we hardly have a conceptual model so we based our, uh, we had a discussion in the group based on basically on this uh, book about uh, uh, hierarchy theory by Owen and Allen. We have some people from epistemology to, to work to help in the group to do so. And so this uh, hierarchy theory, theory basically very sim simply, uh, in a very simple way, it's, it's just another way, it's a particular way to understand the world. So basically why they suggest you should have a focal level a superior level that constrain possible behavior of the focal level and a low level that make possible several behaviors of the focal level. This varies in the low frequency and this varies in the high frequency. Obviously, for us, range of salinity variation, 
grain size and contamination, they are up there. They vary, but they vary in a low frequency. And here, allowing several behaviors of the benthic assemblages, we have just input and output of individuals. Yeah, we will end up, uh, uh, we will obviously, we will end up to fix those with the manipulative experiment, doing settlement experiments to see how the, the input and output will, will uh, it works, how it works really. What about here at Moss Landing? What do you come to do here? You know, watching whales, go looking for the big foot, <laughs> mystery spots, keeping weird. Not really. Well, in one of the projects, a multidisciplinary approach, there are work back home. We, it's a big project. It's all kinds of projects, and there is, uh, we always bring uh, external evaluators. One of them say, look, I think that your case is a good case for alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. And I said, yeah, uh, I might have some time to do so when I go overseas, otherwise I would never be able to do it. So what I'm putting here is, I'm gonna show, I'm doing this analysis, looking at those patterns, some data from here, from this loop, and San Francisco Bay. Those data that we saw with a couple of more systems that I'll show you, and data from France that I got it with the Hughes Blanchett, which was uh, also a research uh, uh, visitor here in the Bentec lab there, but he's gone already. He stayed here for six months or so. So the data comes from, you know, the RPM, you probably guys know about it, you know, the several projects for Bentec Ecology Lab, the French Adour Garonne Water Agency, I hope nobody speaks French, as me, and some several projects in Brazil, my, that are, which are coordinated. So for instance, this is one year, there was, I have the data from uh, San Francisco Bay, actually there is Bentec sampling on those stations in red. So in San Francisco there is uh, five different years. The stations, they vary, some of them they're fixed, some of them they vary, but they're always different regions they were sampled, like River, Suisun Bay, San Pablo Bay, Central Bay, and so on. This flu, the data from the Bentec lab, so that's the, the, the stations that we have uh, uh, Bentec uh, sampling, which uh, the intertidal ones. I'm going to show only intertidal analysis, but I have data from, uh, or subtidal, sorry, but I have the data of intertidal, but I didn't have the chance to look yet. And then the France ones. There is two systems, Seudre and Charente, that's my best French accent, <laughs> and Adore and Bidassoa here. So up there, well, I have the, I just plotted in Google Earth the sampling stations here, several replicates of Bentec uh, sampling. And if you go, that's in the south, you can see here the highly, uh, you know, there's urbanized uh, coast. Actually, uh, Hughes, the French guy that was here with us, was, he was really amazed by the fact that he could go in Elkhorn Slough and see not, you know, uh, sea wall around the whole system. That's uh, Europe. And that, that's the Bidassoa. Here is Spain, here is France. I have never have been there. I just have the data, unfortunately. And this is from back home, the three systems. And two other ones that I added here, that's Mataripi and Sao Paulo. There's two little estuaries there. So you see here, Salvador, huge. But here, it's a very pristine. Here as well, and here as well, comparing with the Elkhorn Slough and comparing to the French system, a, si a simple a look on the Google Earth, you're you gonna realize that. So this is the new, the new, the two new ones. This is Mataripe and Sao Paulo. This is one of the oldest refinery in South America. Uh, there is working since the 1950s. So there is a, a very narrow channel entrance. This is a tidal flat, a very large tidal flat. So this area supposed to be very contaminated, especially with organic. So most of the system, some of the system wouldn't be sampled with a high train, trained creel, fast and super comfortable boats and several high tech instruments, like those ones, that's reality. <laughs> so sometimes you just end up like you stuck it here <laughs> for six hours waiting for the tide, but just, just a detail, you know, don't, don't bother. 
So what are you doing about those things? Gamma, beta, and alpha diversity. Just a quick remember. So comparing, for instance, a region or estuary, A and B, so have different sides. So if you think, uh, although each symbol with, with each color represents one species or taxon, right? So you can see, think about gamma diversity, it's larger here than there. You think about uh, alpha diversity, you think uh, that site three is smaller than four. The local diversity is increasing from three to four to two, which is equals to one, right? And the beta diversity, which is one that I'm interested at the moment, uh, most than the others, actually is how much change from one side to the other within this region. So from site one to two, none. And from three to four, there is a, a change in, in the species composition. There is a change in the beta diversity. So do you have this data? This data that I have, there's different times, different sample schemes. But I need to make sure that I have a good sampling. Uh, yeah. Could you go back just one second? Sure. No, yeah, I'm, I'm stupid. So Sorry? Could you share what the little gamma, alpha, beta is? Well, gamma is the large scale That's one. Large. Alpha is the local one. The beta is whatever is left, which is the change from one side to another. So there is no, Sorry. the beta diversity from here to here is zero. Yes, that's tricky. Looks easy, but can be tricky sometimes. So the condition to work on the data, look at the uh, uh, richness or diversity is to have a good sampling of the system. So to just put, you know, add sampling area here and have uh, richness here, a good indication that I, you have a good sampling of the a good representation of the diversity of that system is if the richness starts to stabilize. Everybody knows it. So I did this for everybody, all the data. So this is San Francisco, it's five different times. Elkhorn Slough, French, 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 and the Brazilian ones. So sometimes what you see, well, that's pretty much, you. Uh, you it's a pretty good indication that you sample, you know, you have a good representation of the richness there. Well, and sometimes a bit more, uh, uh, not, not so uh, stabilized, but nothing is like that. You know, there's nothing increasing exponentially. So I assume that I have good representation of the diversity. Again, I'm gonna show one graph in detail, then I'm gonna show lots of graphs. So please pay attention for this one at least. So this is distance from the mouth, which I calculated. This is uh, number of taxa. So I have San Francisco base five uh, different times from July 2008 to April 12, last year. So you, what you can see here is alpha diversity, it's just richness along the history. So it is decreasing, right? What you can see when you do for everybody, this is the Brazilian stuff. And this is the uh, California one, California one, and then the French one. Well, it looks like the Brazilians are decreasing. San Francisco Bay are decreasing richness. This low is crazy. This low is up there. Ador, the next one there, not sure, probably stabilized. And the other ones might be decreasing too. So it looks like the, the general trend is a decrease, really. And considering the additive uh, formula of the gamma, which is gamma equals alpha plus beta, I did those graphs in representing all the systems on different dates. So gamma is this simple. It's just the richness in each system at each date, whatever was found there. So you see San Francisco had higher levels of uh, richness, you know, than the other systems. And then I put it also here, the alpha diversity which is the way that I calculated was, was the average uh, diversity of replicates within different regions of that history. Anyway, whatever is left <coughs> is the beta diversity. So the things that intrigues me a bit, but I don't have an, any answer, this is, this is going full on. This is Brazil, France, and USA. I mean, I just have, I have spent in the last two weeks work on those data really. So what it looks like is the proportion 
of the alpha diversity is higher in temperate estuaries than in tropical estuaries. Don't ask me why. Yeah. Anyway, the thing is the beta diversity, which is the difference from the, the lighter to the darker uh, 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 bars, is a variation of, of the species composition of, of the ocean basis. I mean, one way to understand the beta diversity, how much of the structure is, cha is changing. If you transform your data, for instance, for a binary data, for presence and absence, and you look at it, compare uh, difference in the dissim in similarities or dissimilarities between sites, that's another way to look at the beta diversity. It's how much it changes from one site, one site to another site in terms of uh, composition of species. So there's lots of people doing this at the moment. You, you got a plenty, you're gonna find plenty of work in the literature. So those guys here, the French guy, Basiaga, with the collaborators sometimes, they actually come out with the following uh, observation. Beta diversity might reflect two different phenomena. Spatial. Uh, spatial species, uh, species turnover, sorry, forget about the spatial, and nestedness. I'm gonna explain this same thing here. So what is nestedness? Nestedness is whenever you change a beta diverse to one side, to another side, and another side, but those two sites are just subset of species from the first site. That's nestedness. And re in turnover and replacement, and when you, you go from one site to another, there's one species out, another is in. And the other one to the other, there's one that is, was in, is out, and there's two new ones. So there are very different phenomena that those two can cause uh, changes in better diversity. Also, this year, those guys, Gutierrez, Canovas, look at the benthic invertebrates in river, they come out with those, the following hypothesis. If you have uh, species richness and stress intensity, those uh, stress intensity always decrease richness. However, if it's a natural stress, they suggest that the uh, beta diversity would be changed by replacement. And if it is an anthropogenic stress, stress, they suggest there will be all nested. Does it make sense? Well, we, we we're gonna discuss a little bit more, so. And fortunately, they invented uh, our package to do those those analysis, which I was struggling a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, finally, I'm getting there. So basically what this analysis does is, is allow us to assess the spatial patterns of beta diversity using multiple site dissimilarity measures. So what it does is calculates uh, beta using Sorensen, which is the total beta diversity. Calculates uh, a beta using Simpson, which is the nestedness component, and whatever left over is the turnover component. So in this, so you have the total here, for instance, beta diversity. This amount is the nestedness component, and this amount is the turnover component. So for this theoretical system, the beta diversity on this system, most of it is nestedness not replacement, I did it here. Sorry, sorry. This is, you know, this is nested, this is turnover. So this is mostly nested. So this is the total beta diversity. This are sh is showing that this is mostly made by replacement and very little done by nestedness which sort of makes sense. If you remember those graphs that I showed you, there are lots of very specific, they're very specific uh, taxa. Lots of taxa occurring at specific regions along each estuary. And obviously, some taxa would occur in more than one region. So that's, that's what I would expect in a pristine estuary, in theory. That's my hypothesis. And you can think also, to better understand it, that you can, you can go to a totally nested, to a totally turnover replacement. So I sort of uh, think that uh, most of the stories will be in between. And here, <laughs> I did it for everybody, you know, the same analysis for all the systems at different dates. So you can see here, 
One system, another one, another one, another one in different dates. Those are the French one. This is the SLU. And all of those are different. Those here from San Francisco. So what you can see here is there is a situation of total replacement in Bidasur, which is a very well-known impacted system in France, also known in Spain, because it's in the, it's in the frontier there. And there is this most uh, less impacted system here are, are showing most replacement and a bit of nesting. But there is also places like the SLU and a French history here. You can see that the better diversity is a contribution of both phenomena, nestedness and replacement. And also mostly nested, what happened, something happened here in San Francisco Bay that changed it. I'm not sure it's going to keep changing. Or it's just the natural variability of the system. And totally nested. That's Sao Paulo River, which is the one that's very close to the refinery. So I'm getting there. That's barrels in preparation. The date is of around 127 minutes ago. <laughs> that's the model that I come out. So that's the biodiverse partitioning in hemispheres. So here you have total replacement, and there total nestedness. In the middle here, you have both contributing for the total better diversity of the system. So in my view, more pristine estuaries will be around here, mostly replacement. You go along, there's new species that end up with a physiological barrier against or, uh, uh, adaptation against salt variability, and you come up with another one, and then you lose on one. Well, a little bit, a little bit will be nestedness, nestedness. And every, anywhere from outside the theoretical model will be uh, uh, impacted system, total replacement, and also total nestedness. This would reflect, in fact, uh, homogeneous or homogeneously. There is pressure everywhere on the system. So wherever it's surviving, in some place there is uh, some species surviving together, but uh, uh, the more resistant ones can go a bit further to this side or this side, so it will be subset of other of that place. The other place will be subset of this place. And this is totally fragmented. So you have one impacted here, only those species can survive, and then you will have a different one over there, all the other species completely uh, replacement. So this is the diverse localized stress. This is general system stress. And this is mostly anthropogenic stress and also mostly anthropogenic stress and mostly natural stress. That's, that's just loud thinking. And final remark, finally, is a good search for patterns will produce solid background for processes of fermentation, theoretical models, which can be widely tested. Better diversity along the stewarding systems can bring some new and useful information. Obviously, if you have a completely nested system, you want to preserve biodiversity, you probably can focus on one or other region. But if your system is, is uh, the better diversity there, is mostly driven by uh, replacement. You probably need to spread the, the area to have more species included in protection zone, for instance. And also, a good story is not good enough if you don't have good data. So I would like to thank uh, several researchers and several students and you know the sponsors of the different uh, things that we use it. And I would like you to thank everybody and more than glad to discuss and answer the questions for you guys. Thank you. Yes.
there's different ways that I can go through my queries. First is the methodological decisions that it has when they do the analysis, right? So the first thing to sort of in trying to in trying to standardize a uh, taxonomical mistake, I put everything up, I put everything currently relevant. And especially thinking if the diversity has more important issues to do with functional, that probably inside a family you have a very similar thinking. So that's one, one, one methodological issue. And the other one was, for instance, to do the beta diversity analysis, I sort of I aggregated different uh, uh, places inside whatever was kn new about uh, a very well-known salinity classification, which is Venice system. Oligoline, mesoline, poloine. So I try to to group its stations accordingly to those to those regions. Uh, another thing is, if you get a, another thing that I have been fighting with all of ad hoc, lately, all of them now are few really. It's like uh, if you want to really generate good science, you really really look at the general try to come out with the general uh, uh, pattern. So if you have, if you put a lot of variability in your analysis, and if you come out with nice patterns, that's, uh, the advance is, is much better because you create conceptual theoretical model that can be much, much more widely used instead of keeping doing study cases. I'm sure there's stuff, are those systems there too different? Well, by definition, they're always two. You know, or methodological, they are very different, well, Somehow, it looks like they have a good sampling of the richness of each system, independent of the, the date that they did, the, 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 the year that they used, how many samples they got it. So, I don't know, did I, did I answer it? But yeah, it, it is a worry, I know, you're right. One of the biggest worries is, is uh, if the area of the sample, you've got enough samples to evaluate area, how do you screen? That's, those are cause the biggest area. Despite all its variations, it's got a lot of similarities. Alcor slough, you know, is the weirdest of them all because it's not an estuary. I mean, would you call estuary? Well, if we follow the definition from three years ago, I would call it. Yeah, but I mean, what would you call it? I call it something. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's more of a greener thing, and it hardly has a gradient at yeah, all. Yeah. You're really sampling without any of the fresh water in because it's, you know, it, it has a seven day residence. I'm sort of gather, gathering literacy to try to, to, to see if those patterns make sense. How and then, then the flu is the, the one of the highest, uh, you know, so organic, so organic so contamination. If you had one other one that was a flat line with the diversity here. Oh, that's a French one. Is that, is that a less of an estuary sense? Well, look, if you look at the Google where to say, like, dude, this is unpacked. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm getting proper uh, data. I'm not sure what's going on there. But I mean, they're very poor, very poor systems. Not all of them, but this one, Sildur. There's two people there. Yes. come with a very neat discussion about this pattern, if it would be applied for uh, which kind of uh, assemblage, if it would be only for fish, only benthic invertebrates, or if it would be applied for places with the real uh, tide variation, not only the benthic. Well, and the discussion is nice, they, they, they come out, they, they bring out some really nice reference, but they, they end up, they, they end up proposing this model, which is basically the same thing. Yeah, sorry. Well, that that point wasn't that point wasn't made. The the point basically was like, oh look, there's lots of variability. You know, there might be different uh, patterns for algae, for fish, 
but we end up decreasing this. So a proper meta analysis would be, would do the job. It would be a hard one to do it, but I've never seen one. Yeah, I mean, Always. I'm sure there are going to have be exceptions, you know, yeah. as everything in, in the world, you know, as everything in nature. The mixing zone is then higher, and the, and, the, and the green end is the highest. Very distinct from the orange. Well, they didn't make the point, but I'm sure that we will have uh, very different uh, systems regarding diversity along the, the history. But it, the, the, the main idea is, is there a general pattern? Well, that's the, the, the proposition. If you look at this blue, it looks like it's completely different. Well, no idea, no idea. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm just considering whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'm not cons I, I those beta diversity. They didn't. They just were made with the raw data. I didn't separate the words. Issues is of it. Maybe yeah. that's. <coughs> well, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe there will be a nice thing, nice thing to think about. It. Yeah. If Bill Francisco makes us smarter, that's the only thing I can identify to stick with Los Angeles for me in all of this history. The incredible number of increased species. And maybe that actually accounts for the high diversity. Rate. I was just, oh, sorry. Well, might be a real, um, might be a might, might be a real problem if there is any reason for us to to think that uh, some places, some regions will be more invaded than the others in the bay. Yeah. The thing is, and it's also the one of the most invaded, and also the one of the most studied. If you compare those systems from those French systems, there's um, there's not much done there. Incredible in Brazil, almost nothing. So it would be hard to separate the exotic ones to San Francisco. We, we still can do it, and then same thing. Say, look, I'm not sure about those other two. No. Thank you.